So I have some slides, like 57 slides, and I'll go through them fairly quickly and uh, talk about some of the cartoons. I'd like to do a Q&A at the end, but if anyone has like a question about one of the cartoons, I'm just say, hey, Harry, and I'll, <laughs> and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll answer it. So um, I said thank you for coming out already, right? Yeah. yeah, I really appreciate it, I really do. It means a lot to me. Yeah, well, they're paying me, so, yeah. It's a gig for me, but I, I would have done it anyway. I haven't done this in a long time, so I did it last year in South Europe, and I, used to, I was saying I used to go to elementary schools all over, the, all over the world. I've been to Dubai and Moscow and St. Petersburg, Singapore and uh, Bucharest, all sorts of places, um, but I don't, I don't do that anymore, so I miss it. Anyway, this is... Uh, me and my siblings. Uh, my sister's a painter in Philly. My brother Charlie's a wildlife artist. My brother John's an educator in Rochester, New York. We're, that's from 1970. Um, we were all on the show called The Electric Company when we were kids. <laughs> that's not true. I'm lying. I'll do some more lying later. Um, I came from a family of artists. Um, any way to turn these lights up? Just these? Yeah, and my dad uh, was a graphic designer for, um, it's okay, for many years, um, and he was a sort of painter, and uh, my uncle, Lee, uh, uncle Leon, Uncle Ken, my Uncle Harry, and that's my dad, and they're all gone now. My dad, I lost my, both my mom and dad this past summer. Um, he was 93, he had a pretty good run, and he really wanted to get the hell out of here. He really did, so. But the gene was passed on you know, to all of us kids, and siblings for that matter. I have two cousins, Phil and Jim Bliss, who are illustrators. Um, Annie, who's a phenomenal um, pottery uh, ceramicist, I should say. This is an early, uh, I was obsessed with uh, Picasso when I was 12, 13. I was just obsessed with uh, all the kind of isms, uh, impressionism and post-impressionism, um, even romanticism. I, I went through all this, so, and I was a pretty rotten kid, and it was, you know, I got into trouble, I burned buildings down. I was, you know, not really, but I did kind of burn the neighborhood down on accident, um, the backyard of the neighbors, and uh, so I got into trouble, but art really saved me. It was the one area that I could go to uh, where I had control. If, if you grow up in a house with a lot of dysfunction, which there was, I think it was in the drinking water, um, in this, you know, there's a lower middle class suburb of upstate New York. But uh, yeah, making art is a way to control what's going on in your world. So it, anyway, I was in doing some uh, cubist work here. Um, I later went on to art school. And this is a watercolor I did when I was a junior at the Philadelphia College of Art, which is where my parents went, and it was then called the Philadelphia Museum School of Art. Uh, they met there in 1958. Um, but I did this for a student competition cover design um, for Print Magazine, which is a graphic design magazine. And I placed third in the competition. It's an international competition, and this was a watercolor I did of these Dutch tiles of this painter having this kind of euphoric moment um, when you paint that comes a moment in the process where you, you, you have a bit of euphoria where you like, ah, oh, that's it, that's it. Um, that's the living room, oh God, uh, of my parents' house, um, which is now owned by someone else and all of that is gone. But uh, these are my parents, some of the paintings, my mom's painting, my dad's, just cluttered cluttered with books and when I left art school um, I waited tables for a long time in Philadelphia um, 12 years I bust I clean the kitchen dishwashing I had a I got a, my girlfriend pregnant and we gave our baby up for adoption I was on welfare so I had a really eclectic and interesting time. Um, but in around 1994 or 5, I started getting work for the first time, illustration work. And the gigs that I got were doing book covers. And I got a lot of mysteries. 
In fact, I became, got pigeonholed into doing mysteries for St. Martin's Press. It was a great gig because I would get the manuscript in the mail, they'd send it to me, and uh, I'd get it and they'd pay me, oh, they're 1200 bucks. It was good money. It's good money for me. And back in, this was 94, 95, that was like three, four months rent. But I'd take it to the 16th Street Bar and Grill and, you know, catch a little buzz and drink this, you know, read the mystery. And, but after a while, I got, they got so formulaic, I, I, didn't, I didn't really, I got sick of reading them. So I sent them to my mom, and I gave my mom 50 bucks. <laughs> but then she went to art school, so she's, you know, she's a voracious reader she was. And she would send notes. She would kind of art direct me. She's like, well, this takes place, you know, the woman's killed by a butterfly guy. So, he, you know, it's a flapper dress, and there should really be butterflies in the cover. I was like, Mom, stop. Yeah, enough. Let me, let me do it. This was actually the very first book cover I did uh, by Douglas Kiker, who was a, I think, an NBC News correspondent for, long, for many years. And this artwork um, was lost. Usually when you do illustrations, you get the artwork back. Okay? They send it back to you. I did this in 1991, I think. And 22 years later, they sent me the artwork back. I couldn't believe it. It's like we're going through our files, this is for Random House. Going through our files, we found this and thought, you know, better late than never, they wrote. <laughs> it was like, anyway. Uh, this is done for Philadelphia Magazine. Oh, watercolor, sorry. Yeah, these are watercolors. This was for Philadelphia Magazine when I was living in Philly. It was a full page piece about um, Amish children, young adults when they reach a certain age, are allowed to sort of make a decision whether they want to stay in the community or smoke pot and <laughs> don't listen to radios. I forget, what is that called? Rumspringa. What's that? Rumspringa. Yes. Thank you. So here he is listening to a Walkman. Another mystery. Um, you can see there's this influence of Vermeer here um, on this one. These were hard to kind of do, you know, difficult paintings, but um, anyway. This is a cartoon. Um, <laughs> speaking of Amish people, um, at a certain point I was, I was living in Nyack, New York. I'd finally moved from Philadelphia and I, was, I got a little apartment in Nyack and I, was, I had a little boy, a little son, my son Alex, and his mom relocated. We weren't married and I was following him around because I didn't want to be far away. And uh, I was in a rare bookstore in Nyack, and I was looking at a book of Charles Adams cartoons, who I always loved growing up. Loved Charles Adams. Appreciated the drawing and, and the wit and the kind of sardonic, uh, dark humor. And I was looking through it, and at the time I was doing book covers, and I thought, I could probably do this, you know? Um, and I recalled back that people said to me, you should try submitting to The New Yorker. And I didn't really have any idea of the cachet of that magazine. I didn't really know. Anyway, went home, knocked off eight or nine samples over the course of two or three weeks, and eventually got a gig, a letter from the cover editor saying, this might be a long shot, but why don't you try doing some cover, cover sketches? And I did. And uh, first I was published as a cover artist, and then about a year and a half later, I started submitting cartoons. And this was an early cartoon. This might be 2003. I was trying to think, like I had the idea the, the Amish midlife crisis came first. I thought, there's something there. And I thought, what, would they, what, would they, what kind of car would they get? Would they, they'd trade in the horse for, you know, a cheetah. <laughs> this was a rejected, early rejected cover of, uh, I believe there was a Haitian immigrant outside of a borough in, uh, outside of Manhattan in a borough. He was shot many, many times. He was unarmed. And Mayor Giuliani was... Um, with a mayor at the time. And uh, this was kind of based on my uh, being inspired by, of course, the infinite incidents, but also Sergio Aragones, who's a great Mad Magazine cartoonist, who did these kind of shadows where it would have the dog and the man walking and the shadows would be completely different. So this is watercolor. This is kind of mixed up. This is a watercolor I did not that long ago. I live in Cornish, New Hampshire now, and uh, I, we, my wife has a house in Burlington, so I, I come back to Burlington every now and again to just check in with her. And <laughs> it's a kind of an interesting marriage. Um, that's really small. Okay. 
I can't do, I'm not going to mess with it, but it's really tiny. Okay, let me go back to that. But it's uh, the New York Public Library lion, and it has the, uh, a little pigeon feathers in its mouth. <laughs> a little tiny bit of blood. Um, and that came from just being in Manhattan and walking by those statues and having pigeons there and just thinking that the lion would completely eat them in a second. So. Uh, this idea for, came from being in an art museum and watching people not really take in the art, but they were sort of wanted to capture the, capture the culture, you know. And that happens even more. I'm not against taking photographs, by the way, of paintings with the camera. I, I do it all the time. But I was seeing people like not really look at the art, and it bugged me. By the way, this painting is my version of Norman Rockwell's version of a Jackson Pollock that ran on, <laughs> <laughs> that ran on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post. And his cover was called The Connoisseur. Was it called The Connoisseur? I don't know. But my editor at the New Yorker, Francoise Mouly, was like, you should try to make it look just like the Rockwell. I was like, are you high? <laughs> but in the end, I compared mine to Rockwell's, and my Pollock is far superior to Rockwell's. <laughs> it's another, uh, I notice a, a lot of the covers I do for the New Yorker are kind of celebrating looking up. And I had a great, uh, I did work, I worked for Playboy for a while, and Michelle Urie was my uh, cartoon editor, and she, she passed away too young, but she um, took me out to lunch one night, uh, one afternoon, I should say. Yeah, she took me out to lunch one night. <laughs> we had a lot of drinks. But, uh, and so we're walking home, and Michelle's like, she stopped, and she, she wore sunglasses. She actually died of cancer. She, I didn't know this, but she had a cancer uh, in her eye or something. I think she wore her sunglasses anyway. But she was kind of a glamorous, um, cool woman, and she put up with a lot of shit from Hef Hefner for many years. And she, she, she just uh, hung in there. But she... Uh, she took my arm and she stopped, she goes, look up. And I looked up at the buildings and she's like, look at that. Look at all that architecture. Look what's going on up there. There's a mist and stuff coming up. She said, look around there. People aren't looking up. And that was before self, that was before phones. So she was great. I miss her. I wish these weren't, these are so small. Sorry. He's got a super soaker. What's the date on that? That's 2008. Five? August 1st, 1st, 2005. Yeah. That's just a, a detail of a cover that I did um, for a, a publication called Weird S Fiction Review. <laughs> and uh, I love Mad Magazine. I love Jack Davis. So this gave me the opportunity to kind of drop into Jack Davis's ink work for those old EC comics and there's a close up and I was kind of proud of that. And that's the actual cover right there. <laughs> These guys yeah. coming to well, great. Yeah, a buddy of mine designed did the, the type and uh this is super fun to work on. Yeah, it's fun. This is a illustration for a book I did for my longtime editor Joanna Kotler, who I love and is a good friend, is a great painter. I, did many children's books with her, uh, Harp, uh, Harper Collins, and this was the last book that we did. One book we did, I should say, and she wrote it. This is she didn't edit. It's called Sorry Not Sorry, and it's a really great children's book about saying you're sorry. I thought it was a fantastic book, and not just it's just it's great because, uh, and I get I used to get manuscripts all the t not all the time, but. Often enough, I got one from Judy Bloom at one point, and I, I didn't really like it. <laughs> but um, this concept of apologizing, I just thought, that's huge. When you say you're sorry and really mean you're sorry, to deeply uh, feel sorry, I just thought that was such a profound thing that I had to do the book. This says, 
won't tell you anything about the rest of it. This is a, a different book. Uh, this was written by K.T. Camillo. I've been really, of course it's in German, this is the German edition. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> so um, I'm a dog fanatic. Just my, I have a memoir coming out called about my dog Penny who passed away after 17 years. So I'm really, sometimes I think there's something wrong with me that I love, I love dogs so much. I do, I fear for my sanity. But anyway, this is called Good Rosie and um, this is a nice, a nice book too. I love Kate DiCamillo. She, there's a real sense of humanity in her writing. This is just silly. <laughs> <laughs> it's the lost Bemelham sketch. I got that on eBay. It's certified. It's the real deal. I remember my cover editor, Francoise Moulet, I walked in one, one day and she had Xeroxed this. I sent it to her. She Xeroxed it and put it on her, on her wall. I was very proud. <laughs> oh, these are so small. I'm really sorry. I might go, I wish I could, maybe I'll get out of this and just hand, hand do it because this is driving me crazy. Hold on. Let us bear with me. I got to escape. Ooh, Hold on. I'm going to go back to, I don't really care. We're here. We're here, right? Ugh. Are you sure you want to open 71 items? <laughs> oh, unselect them like that? Thank you. Gonna need you. Stay with me. Now what just happened? What? I mean, I don't really care. <laughs> I might need tech help. Does anybody know how to do I don't know how to do this, so I, honestly, this could be a... Maybe you should just stick with the smaller Well, I don't even know how to get back to that now, to be honest with you. I, 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 yeah. It's in a folder called Dartmouth that is on the desktop, but as soon as I plugged into this... Well, this one. That guy. See how small the cursor is? You can't even see it. That's the idea. Now, if I do that, will it go to the next one? No. Well, if, if, if we move you, you know, escape here. That's what I tried. Yeah. And if we. You can do this. <laughs> no, I'm just. How did you get your folder so small? It, as soon as I plugged in, if I unplug it, okay. it'll. Gotcha. It's because it's plugged into this. It's the library's fault. <laughs> to turn it into a slideshow would be ideal. Right. It won't let us go forward. Anymore. Right. So that's the issue. And you want me to find the folder? Dartmouth. It just says tiny. That's it. Now why can't we turn that into a slideshow? It's so weird. Libraries. I love libraries. They li literally saved my life growing up. I mean, art did too, but libraries, being in high school, a public high school, was in the 70s, was brutal, absolutely brutal. But I could go to the library and I'd get picked on. Uh, I, it was quiet. Um, art books were everywhere, comic, books with comics in them. And I could go to the library and find peace. It was just like, saved my life. And, I would and it was free. I could take books out of the library <laughs> under my arm with a black t-shirt on in the middle of winter in Rochester, New York. And um, yeah, it just was, and that, that hasn't changed over the years. You know, that's exciting, whatever happened there. <laughs> and at least I can, so we're down. 
That's what it was. In the, in the oh, it would be right up, corner. right there, maybe. No, date created, size, name. That's not it. So we're looking, you know. It should be like a, a rectangle with smaller. Yeah, that's, that's what we're Yeah, that's what that's he's what in, yeah. Now. So you wanted to go to this one, right? Yeah, the next one, yeah. So small. You want to just sit down? Yeah, I'll just. <laughs> Harry and I went to college. Yeah, tomorrow. John. We actually we went to art school together in Philadelphia. He's a graph designer. Yeah. Um, this cartoon I really like, um, just because I like the closer. Like people would say, you said meow. Anyway, all right. Can I go to the next one? Oh, was it down there? It's just down there. Oh. Okay. So this is uh, gluten recalls a time before their intolerance. <laughs> <laughs> this is like a poor. He's got a little fish shirt. I forgot it. He's got a little fish shirt on. <laughs> okay. We'll go to the next one. Zooming out. Yeah, it's under it. It's the pollen. Yeah. This was really a. <laughs> this was a really hard drawing to do, because I had to make sure it really looked like Shelley Duvall. It was really hard. <laughs> then they also f I, initially this had the little st st not uh, the little stems coming off it, and that's not where the pollen comes from. The New Yorker fact checked that for me. <laughs> And they said, they actually, you have to change it. So I added these. Anyway, yeah. Oh, it's the Moses, right? People really like this one. It was an old Seven Days cartoon. I think I did an alternate version of this where he's got a metal detector. It's weird, my drawing, I used to do watercolor, like watercolor cartoons for the New Yorker, but I don't, I don't do them. Let's go, they're yeah, all under. I'm it's just the, trying to find my. That guy. Oh, the cursor, the, yeah, yeah. The cursor. Like, oh, no. Oh, Harry, when you did watercolor, did you do an ink drawing first? Yeah, a brush, ink line, yeah. yeah. Kind of old school, Charles, just like Charles Adams would do it. I would imagine, yeah. This idea came to me, I was driving uh, from Cornish to Burlington and there was a, you see them, they're Cooper's Hawk and they're sitting there and they look so, they look so badass and regal and just really impressive and that's where it came from. Should we be able to just use the down arrow since that's still selected? It, that it, it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, with yeah there was some, tr well wait, switch to. <laughs> <laughs> really don't like speeders. I, I, don't, I, yeah, there came a point in my life where um, I really, I go slow. Like, I drive pretty slow. Um, I mean, if I'm on the highway, you know, if it's wide open and there's no one around, I'll do 75, whatever. But if I'm driving where there are people, I, I tend to go pretty slow. I don't know why, I, is that an age thing? I don't even know. You don't drive, do you? <laughs> All right, let's check. You had the Nirvana shit on. I thought he probably drives. <laughs> I remember when Nirvana's first album came out. 93, was it? And I was old in 93. I was like 35. <laughs> That's pretty recent. 2000, 2000 uh, 2023. Yeah, I was in a bar with a friend of mine in Philly, and we heard, we heard that on come and I was like, what is this? These guys are incredible. So, you better spill it, Frank, because we got your pal Mittens in the next room singing like Lady Gaga. <laughs> Lady freaking Gaga. 
So there's a narrative. I like narrative cartoons and where you can kind of, sometimes you can, you know, different captions. It becomes, you spend more time there, you know. And I like the, the imagining what happened before, the, before it and then after it. All right. And it's very film noir-y. I mean, I grew up on old Billy Wilder movies, and this, this is kind of <laughs> still thinking about that squirrel, huh? <laughs> I'm laughing at my own cartoon. I just love that little face. He's just like, how do they do it? They're like it's little Pope. There's something else. There's a story going on outside the frame. Right. And you just refer to it, and then do we get to see all that? Yeah, it's, yeah, I, tr I mean, I try, that's kind of the, the goal, it's like a, I, there's a film there, and we're dropping in on some moment, I think. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Oh, this is good. Sorry. <laughs> I really don't have much to say about that one. <laughs> So I wanted to, I include my journals. I keep a journal and I, I've, I journal every single day, every morning, every morning, and it's fill up the journal with things. Yes, uh, I think it's this one right here. Yep. And these are, uh, that's Beatrix Potter. I'm not sure what, what I, um, I don't know what this says, but we better get off this before they read something that's <laughs> really not cool. <laughs> Oh, this is a sketch for a cover I did uh, for The New Yorker. Uh, we all kind of, I worked, I, this was my, it was a collaborative effort with Art Spiegelman, uh, his wife, even Remnick pitched in on this. Art Spiegelman had the idea, we can go to the next one and I think see the finish. But um, is it, yeah, I think it's right under it. Which was great to have all these people. I love collaborating. I'm not one of those cartoonists who, I really enjoy everyone chipping in, but yeah, Art's idea was to put the Clorox there. Um, I think at a certain point, Francois said, make, instead of Lurch, we're gonna have Lurch from the Adams family, because this is very Charles Adams. I mean, that's supposed to be Jared Kushner is there. Uh, these are QAnon kids. Um, there's a little portrait of Vladimir Putin right there. And uh, this was, again, Father Time, 2020, COVID ball. It's all in there. On the stocking, it says Donald. <laughs> it says Donald, Donald, Donald. <laughs> and I start. I started working with Steve Martin in twenty. I don't know. What are we? Twenty four. Twenty twenty one. Twenty two. And he. Uh, he was at a dinner with my cover editor and he had some ideas for cartoons and he said, do you know anybody? And she, she said, yeah, you, I know somebody who likes to collaborate, Harry Bliss. And he actually knew my cartoons from the LA Times. And then he started sending me some ideas, emailed me some ideas and, and that's how it all started. Yeah. And it, that picture, by the way, we were, it was a photo shoot for the New York Times and he was like, He's walking, he's great, he's just walking, he's like, Harry, he goes, I'll show you how to fake laugh on camera. <laughs> it's like, really, it's really funny. And I was really, it was like a little less, it's like, but I was just, I was laughing at him, so he was making me laugh. Um, let's see, what's below that? Uh, oh, that's a fun one, yeah. <laughs> This was, this was kind of tricky, drawing that. I had a friend of mine years ago who said, you suck at drawing guns. And ever since then, I'm like, I gotta, I gotta learn how to, yeah, right, I gotta make sure the gun's right. And yeah. It was fun to draw. I mean, they're all kind of fun to draw. This is one of Steve, this is one of Steve's, I think. I think. <laughs> This is, this is just to show you the, like, their, what they look like before I add any graphite. It's just How a lot. How long does it take? Two hours. Yeah, like two hours. They start off in the journal. You can go to the next one. I, they start off in the journal sometimes as little, like if he sends me an idea, or I think of an idea, I'll do a little rough of it, and then 
yeah, and there's the finish. And uh, mm -hmm. so, you know, I'm always thinking, I'm, I'm kind of always working, because I'm always, you, yeah, when you're a cartoonist, you're kind of, your brain becomes trained to see and hear cartoons. <clears throat> People said, you ever run out, of, run out of ideas? And I, not, not in a million years could I run out of ideas. <laughs> No, it's just a pencil. Yeah, it's, a, it's actually a mechanical pencil I use. But if you want to go to my Instagram account, there are videos of like, me drawing, which will really show you. I'm not going to try to explain it. <laughs> Someone said, you know, that fish isn't that terribly drawn. It's hard to draw. From me. I think Picasso, didn't Picasso say, I spent, I've spent my entire life trying to draw like a child. Yeah. Trying to unlearn what, what you learn, which is very interesting. Yeah, this looks, I don't know, but that's right, that's actually right, yeah. Okay. That's when Steve calls me, I put in Navin Johnson, because that's his name in the jerk. <laughs> and so he, he doesn't call all the time, but when he does call it, just I'll, before I answer the phone, I'm like, <laughs> get a good laugh out of that one. Um, there was a sandwich at August 1st in Burlington that I ordered yesterday called The Jerk, and I took a picture of it and sent it to him. Oh, so Steve will have, uh, he has a very specific mind, we all do, but his is very quirky, and this was one idea that he said, you know, I had this idea for a cartoon, it's an a, a overhead shot of a Las Vegas genie convention. And that's, that's like, I would never think of that. And he said, and then he sent me these lines, I think, I'm, uh, I think I'm getting a new bottle. What kind of cork do you use? Have you seen the new screw tops? A thousand years, that's nothing. And he had more lines to go, and I just, I was like, you know what, I'm not going to do that. That's too much work. Anyway. And the next one I like is a page from our first book. This is a, oh, yeah, we can read. So he says, well, Harry, I got to say. I've been a city boy my whole life, but that walk in the woods was spectacular. I saw a deer, bear, scat, a squirrel, some kind of bird. I think I saw a rhino. I just don't see a downside. There, I got it. What a nasty looking tick. Okay, now you check me. <laughs> and it's, right, ticks. It's like, that's what you gotta do. You go out, you're in the woods, you come inside, you strip your clothes down. <laughs> But that, this, I like this drawing, because I'm pretty, I think that's kind of what he looks like naked. <laughs> those, those strips of, to do with Steve, and we did a lot with Penny. That was Penny, here's Penny on the cover. This is my, Penny is the, my wife and I, Sophie, had our dog Penny, that again, I, she's been on New Yorker covers, and we had her, 17 years is a long time to have a dog. And uh, yeah, when you lose a dog, it's, you all, if you have a dog and you've lost a dog, it's just crushing. It's just a crushing thing. So I would go to the next one. But, and Steve said the same thing. He said, I, he said, it's, like the, he said it's the second worst thing that could possibly happen to you. Um, this one was, this one, this one is Steve's too. I, every now and again, I'll draw him in the cartoon. I don't do it very often. But this was, this was um, I think you can see, I've like scratched out in the graphite here to get some of that. Steve, he lo he's a huge Winslow Homer fan, as um, I and so he, I try to tap into Homer, some of the seascapes. We do it on time. Oh, this one is, it says, Barnaby, if by chance the cats are ahead in the bridge game, hold off on serving the smoked salmon bites. <laughs> very good, Miss Penny. <laughs> I like this one. That's, that's very much like with Penny. But again, this comes from reading um, a lot of ideas I will get from reading. Uh, P.G. Wodehouse, uh, Benchley. Yeah, it's a miniature poodle, yeah. Kind of a scruffy little, yeah. 24. I'm just thinking of the body bag I have in Cornish that I had to bring her in. It has the date on it. It was October 11, 2022. Yeah. Did she show up in your drawings before she was, before you lost her or, or after? 
She continues to show up in the drawings. I drop, yeah, I'll put her in every now and again, yeah. And I have a new dog, too. Um, this was Steve's cartoon. This is his, uh, I think I sent him the drawing, and then he, he added the, uh, this is completely Tintin on the moon. It's RJ, RJ Tintin on the moon, totally. He loves dogs. He just got a, he had a dog in his book. Um, there's a passage about his dog, Roger. He can't, there's, if, we tried to have a discussion on the phone about, he was gonna read the passage. I think it's in our book, it's in the first, he couldn't read it, he started crying. Yeah, couldn't read it. They just got a new, so this is, this was like, Again, this is a very Steve idea. Come on, Penny, I'll teach, I'll teach you how to fly. You cup your hands like this and flap them up and down. And it's, and then, anyway. Oh, here comes Harry. What's up, nothing? <laughs> oh, this is good. And I, I, I put this little book of LSD because I was experimenting with psychedelics at the time, so. <laughs> but um, he, um, yeah, Steve, He's got, there's a surreal side to his sense of humor that I really like. Anyway. That's the cover. We can skip this, it's, it's kind of boring. But there's Penny again. Not a great, it's kind of Penny and you know. What's this? Oh, this shows you, this shows you the sketch for the Oh, this is a sketch for the second book we did. It's, his, uh, it's called uh, Other Diversions. Number one is Walking and Other Diversions. So he was telling me, he would write the script and tell us about three amigos. He says, Harry, wake up. I remembered something. And I like this. My favorite part of this is we're sleeping. And I'm like, wahoo. And Penny turns around and is pissed off. It's like, Martin. Like he woke, woke <laughs> us up. But um, these, were, these strips were super fun to do, and he was completely open with uh, having me integrate, like we'll be walking in the woods. I integrated New Hampshire, Vermont, and it was, he really enjoyed that, which was a huge relief for me, because I, I really, I love to draw um, the woods and nature and all that stuff. This was, uh, we got to do a thing on uh, in the New York, what's this place in New York? Uh, the, Town Hall in New York, uh, with Nathan Lane was moderating it, and Steve was there, and it was so much fun. And he just, that's basically, I laughed the whole time. Because these guys are so good. They're so funny. You're just sitting there laughing? Well, I was drawing, I did some drawings on a big screen, and this is just, it's kind of crazy. I, I stopped thinking about, there was a time early on when we started collaborating where I was like, Oh my God, this is Steve Martin. I grew up, I grew up, you know, loving Steve Martin. He was my hero. But it went away. And I guess when I met him and spent some time with him, he's like, he's just a really nice guy. And I, I don't know. Yeah, it's not there anymore, which is nice. Um, this is the, this is where the title of my book come, came from, comes from, yeah which is, you know, that's the brutal thing about having a dog. Even my dog now, Junior, we go to the next one before I start crying. Yeah, then my dog now, it's like sometimes I look at Junior, and Junior's just like a year and three months, and I'll just be like, Jesus, you know, it's gonna, how am I gonna? But someone said to me recently, when you have a dog, um, you have all this love, and you have to keep giving it to the dog. You have to keep giving it to another dog, another dog, another dog. This is a rough, this, these are just cover ideas that uh, I think for that. Let's get back to funny. Oh, that's a good one. That's very autobiographical. <laughs> <laughs> that's like the Mickey Mouse hair. <laughs> so. This is a. This shows you from the journal, so you'll see what the roughs look like in my journal. And this was, I think this was Steve's idea. And then the next one, you can see um, the actual cartoon, I think. And we switched the, um, I think we switched the, he switched the line on it. I like, and I like this line better. <laughs> I 
but you can see it's you can see it's very film noir, very uh, cinematic, and I borrow a lot from. But I still watch. I watch a film, a Criterion Channel film, every night, pr pretty much. This is a strip I did for Mountain Gazette magazine, which is a new magazine that just started. It's not a new magazine. It was big in the 70s, large format, and it started up again. Mike Rogge, who was, lived in Burlington, uh, started it again. Anyway, Steve and I have been contributing uh, double-page spread comics to this publication. And this, is the f this one I did by myself without Steve. This is the first one I did. This is uh, about my dog, Junior. I got a puppy, a little uh, uh, Aussie Shepherd, standard Aussie Shepherd. And I'm absolutely, so yeah, if you can read this, but this is exactly how it went down. I was, I was first allergic to the dog. I almost got divorced over this. Sophie was allergic. She was flipping out. She, she couldn't believe I got another dog. I got a dog. She's now come to love Junior, but it was really tough. Um, and it was at night, getting up, you take your puppy out at 3 a.m. to take a, go to the bathroom, whatever, and... Uh, and he does. He humps a little towel on the, he, just a little, you know, he's happy. He eats, after he eats, he gets excited. So he goes out onto the patio and humps a little towel because he's so happy. So I it's like, get a room, you two. But if you ever go to Cornish, New Hampshire, you go to the next one. It's like, um, uh, Maxfield Parish lived there and worked there. And it's just like his paintings. It's, just, I mean, you look at, at night and you see where, that's Junior. Oh. Right? <laughs> Such a good boy. <laughs> Such a good boy. Not a great boy just a good He's a good boy. <laughs> G-O-O -O boy. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, there's another one there. Little dog says, uh, Mrs. Robinson, you're trying to get me to chew your stockings. Again, totally inspired from films. The Graduate was a seminal movie for me. It was my kind of catcher in the rye. It was like huge for me, that movie. It was the first, I saw a movie and I was like, oh, I can leave home and just go after a girl. That's something I could just do without, I don't have to ask my parents. Yeah, no, that oh, should be that. Oh, we did it twice, so go down to the next one, I guess. <clears throat> oh, I think I see it. Two 60-year-old men looking for a cursor. Oh, there you're over here now, so. There you go. Yeah, good luck. Godspeed. Oh, you're on that, so. There we go. Oh, okay. I'm a, oh, well, I'll talk about that because I'm a, I'm a collector. I collect art. I actually spend most of the money I earn on art. That's the other thing I love about Steve because if there's something that yeah. I, um, I'm unsure of, I'll ask him about it. He knows most of the auction sites. And, but, um, You've seen his collection, right? Not all of it. it, it yeah, his and Anne's, the both of them, yeah. I stared at that hockey. <coughs> oh, you did the splash I one? Just at yeah, him. yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got that. Steve's got a great eye. He's got a great eye. Um, yeah, this collection's insane. There's a Lucian. He's a Lucian Freud. That's. I, I there's no caption here, but I love uh, Willard Metcalf, a Cornish colony artist. I love. If you get a chance, look up Willard Metcalf. Brilliant. One of my favorite American Impressionists. I just bought a, a Willard Metcalf pastel that I got really cheap. This is Wanda Gog. I don't know, a really fantastic illustrator, artist. Um, yes, millions of cats. Yeah, she was, she was a fantastic artist. Check her work out. There are books on her. Well, we go to the next one. This is a watercolor of hers that I picked up at auction maybe a year ago. And it's of, I mean, it's nice to get a print, but this is an actual watercolor. And it's about, you know, this big. 
thin paper, and it's gorgeous. It's just gorgeous. I, have, I bought an N.C. Wyatt. I have a huge N.C. Wyatt. I, and I'll, oh, this is, a, this is a nice segue. That was completely unplanned, too. I met Andrew Wyatt years ago. I went to Chad's Ford, Pennsylvania, and hung out with Andy and his wife, Betsy, for about two and a half hours. And um, we had grown up. We were huge Wyatt fans. Uh, we sat for a while. At one point, Betsy got up and left us to kind of hang out. He talked about Hopper. And, but at some point, I was going to take the picture. I said, can I take your picture? Or maybe I'll get one of you. And she said, yeah, I'll get one of you and, uh, and Andy together. And Andy said, I get an idea. Why don't we stage something here? I mean, really. He was like 90 at the time. And he said, I'll get on the floor. And he said, Betsy, you take your cane and get on top of me and go like that, like you're going to hit me. And I, I've got more photographs of them, like this photo shoot. And it was hilarious, just absolutely hilarious. This is all in the, the memoir. I wrote the whole essay up in the memoir. But what a, what a trip, you know? What a total trip. They were, they were so generous, and they really loved the cartoons. They loved the drawings. The, oh, that's, the, that's my Wyeth. They loved the kind of crude, Andy loved the crude quality of the, my drawing, because I brought a bunch of drawings with me, because I, I knew I was going to be really nervous. I'm like, I'll just put these out and see what happens. <laughs> um, okay. I think we're almost done. No? There's a couple. How are we doing? We're 714. Getting close to the end. I like this one. This is very autobiographical. I like to come here sometimes all by myself and shout the most offensive things I can think of. Like, not, maybe not everyone like this one I like because you can't, you can't anymore. You can't. And I also like that drawing. I'm very proud of that drawing. It was really, um, yeah, if I might say so myself. We'll go quickly. I'll go quickly then. Oh, this is a recent one of Steve's. You never see them roll over. Why should you? <laughs> oh, this one's sick. It's not sick. It's, kind of, it's actually very sweet in a way because... Shotgun! <laughs> because I, I did a book called Death, my first cartoon collection, Death by Laughter, was actually a lot of death cartoons. And I remember when that came out, and uh, I got a, a few, more than two, people saying that how uh, there was a, uh, a retirement community or a hospice place. They had the book in their library and made so many people laugh, like they really appreciated it. Um, you know, kind of laugh in the face of death. Oh, this is another strip. This one actually, this is a sneak preview. This isn't even out yet. But Steve wrote this. It's about um, Andy Warhol. And um, you know the Shot Marilyns? Anyone know the Shot Marilyns? Um, well, in the, there was a studio in 1964. Andy Warhol created a series of five silkscreen images of Marilyn Monroe, each a different color. This was a blast to do, by the way. That's Lou, that's Lou Reed, by the way. And the studio, I wanted Dracula in there because it's just in. Um, the silkscreen portraits, basically this woman came into the studio in 1964. Her name was um, Pober. You can Google this. Uh, Dorothy Podber. She said, can I shoot these? Andy thought, yeah, you can photograph them. She pulled out a revolver and shot, shot them right off. They were stacked four together. They later became, and then <laughs> he's like, and then I like this little pop, pop art thing. So. The shot Marilyn's, as they came to be called, acquired instant cachet, and uh, shot blue sage Marilyn was sold at Christie's in 2022 for $195 million. And Andy Warhol, you know, he, he, of course, he's, he's gone now, but if he were there, he would, have been, he would say, wow. <laughs> this one I really like, too. Like a, Take it easy, Billy. I'm just going to give her a treat. <laughs> This might be the last one. That's Junior. That's a recent one. That's like that old commercial where, wasn't that 70s commercial where the guy was like walking in Paris and he's, 
He just says, I love this woman. I don't care who knows it. Remember, do you remember that? It was a commercial. No, never. <laughs> All right. Thanks, John. Thank you. Big round. God bless you. Just going to stay up there. Trotsky in Vermont. Trotsky in Vermont, yeah. Well, I just, I brought, I did this because I was just messing around with um, drawing. I, I, William Steig once said he just, he, he loved to like see what happens, to see where the ink moves and where it goes on, on the page. And I always thought, I always loved that. Uh, there was something that I did at elementary schools. I would have kids come up and draw a scribble because uh, I was trying to get the kid uh, over the intimidation of the paper. So I would have them do a scribble like that. I'm not going to have anyone here do it because I don't feel like it. It's a cool game, by the way, to play with anyone. I still play it, you know, when I'm out and I have paper. But so you look at this and you think, well, what can I turn it into? Um, And turn it. Anybody have any ideas? I'll be, pretend this is a classroom. What do you think this could be turned into? What do you think? Oh, it could be a. I like that. That's not a very good student. You're not being. A, <laughs> you're gonna get in trouble. <laughs> Go with the dog. You know my bro my brother is an educator, and this is a terrible dog. So let's just get rid of this. I hate this drawing. Oh, it sucks. <laughs> always, always get you know. Just don't be afraid to destroy your work. My brother's an educator, and I hope this is filmed and he sees this. And I went to his school in Rochester, New York, and I said I had him do a scribble. Right? I'm like John. Let's get Mr. Bliss up there to do a scribble. Here's what my brother's scribble was. I'm not kidding. And all, every adult in the whole room, all the teachers were just like. <laughs> and I'm like, OK, that's cool. What? I don't know what I did. I don't know. I, yeah, I'm not going to. I'm just going to go away. I didn't make it go away. But um, yeah, I, lo I love to draw trees. And the thing that I'll, I'll tell people about drawing is um, to understand I'm reading about Leonardo da Vinci right now. Uh, Isaacson. In fact, I finished Isaacson. Did I finish it? I think I did. But da Vinci, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, was off the charts, unbelievably amazing. I can't, there's no one else who's ever lived, in my opinion, who was as smart and is just as amazing as da Vinci was. The guy dissected 30 cadavers and drew everything he knew about them. Everything, and they were the drawn beautifully. Just miraculous drawings. So, all this to say, if you want to understand trees, you have to just study them and keep watching them. Like now I'm learning, oh, the bark's really quite different on a sugar maple than, uh, you know, pine trees are different in the background and white pines. And oftentimes, if I'm cartooning, I will start this way because I love to draw this stuff. I love drawing. It's a way for me to draw the things that I love to draw. I'll put a dog here, you know, with some guy walking the dog. And then I'll think of, like I said earlier, I'll think of a narrative that led up to this moment in the walk. And there was a recent cartoon I just did where it had the guy walking and there's a big landscape. I think it was yesterday's cartoon. And he says to the dog, behold, my antidepressant. <laughs> saying, Just look at the nature. So, um, this qu anybody have questions? Yeah, I'm moving over here now. Did ever ask you to do a specific uh, cartoon or a specific topic? Or? They, they used to send out uh, kind of calendars. Not, not really, though, no. They'll send out a calendar. And every now and again, um, like when Osama bin Laden was killed, they had sent out a, you know, urgent, we need a cover on this right away. And I submitted a cover that was, I thought was very good. And I thought they should have run it. It was just, a, it was an ocean. It was just a shot of the ocean, just a watercolor. And there was just a turbulent waters and because they buried him at sea and 
It was yeah. nothing but turbulent times then and now. And but they went with something else. It was a a picture of Osama bin Laden with, and then someone erased it, which I thought was kind of a shallow. They're like, you know, I don't. I'm opinionated, but I've just I've gone from answering your question to, you know, <laughs> touting how how good I am. <laughs> it's like. Ed Cohen spoke here about five or six years ago. Yeah. And one of the things he talked about was the connection between the art and the caption. Mm -hmm. And he said that somehow he had the, the art down, and then it was a challenge to get a caption that was an appropriate length. Um, I was wondering if you could. Now, since you keep a journal where mm -hmm. you, it looks like you're writing and drawing, mm -hmm. maybe you see mm -hmm. that in a different way, but could you comment on? How it works for you, connecting the art and the words? Well, they have to be, they should be inseparable. In other words, they have to rely on each other. So um, a good example of that is the guy sleeping with the vodka bottle. Like you, the caption says, you awake, question mark. There's not, you can't, it needs the drawing. So, but um, it's different with every cartoonist because my captions is my style of writing. It's, there's a cadence to it. There, there's a way that uh, I want it to flow, like a song, you know? It was just one yesterday. My wife and I, I was, I was going, I did the drawing, and it came down to one word. It was a fairly decent size, length caption, but it was instead of a device, my device, like blah, 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 um, a device was better than my device. And it was better because, because a device, he was talking about his phone. He was walking in the woods and saying, basically he's walking in the woods with his dog. He's talking into his phone. He says, hey Siri, set a reminder uh, for me so I know how wonderful it is to be walking in the woods without my device. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it was really important that it be a device because it's more universal than my device. It's too per I felt like my device is somehow it was too personal. I might be wrong, but that's an example of how you could get pretty nitpicky. Um, it has to be right. And it's how I talk. It's how I would talk too. Did it come to you at the same time? So the art and the words, or the... No, not at all. That was me drawing. I, li I literally did a drawing of a guy walking in the woods, just like I would draw here. And I really liked the drawing. And I stared at it. And, and then he had a phone. He had a phone. So he, he had the phone. He's walking. And then at first I had something coming out of the phone, like he's listening to someone. And I didn't really have anything. And then, did I ask someone? Wait, I might have... Did I? Oh, no, no, then it came to me. Then it, something came to me like, no, he should be saying something. Uh, I'm sorry, my wife, that's her cartoon. <laughs> that's her idea. So I should clear it up. Because she gave me the idea about um, him thinking something about how wonderful it is to be in nature and then using his device to remind him of that. That was her idea. And I just changed it. I said, how tranquil. I used it. I wanted the word tranquil, how tranquil it is. Am I over explaining it? But yeah, it's, it can be very complicated. It, it can be, well, it's like, like I said, it's like writing a song or anything. Yeah. You mentioned before that you now see things automatically as cartoons as you're going through life. Do you find that ever creating a wall between you and the experiences you're having because you're framing things in terms of future cartoons? No, I don't think so. You mean, does it get in the way of my pre being present? And yeah. I don't think so. Um, I mean, it almost has to a little bit because if, if, I, if I see something as a potential cartoon, I, I am, I'm working then. Like, like, like yeah. does your wife or good for people who know you well say things like, are you doing it now? Kind of, <laughs> kind of. Yeah, my wife definitely, yeah, I mean, wasn't, wasn't there, was there a, oh, it's, there's a really funny movie called uh, Walk Hard, the Dewey Cox story with John C. Riley, which is so funny. And they're having an argument, they're getting divorced, and, and she, 
uh, Kristen Wiig just looks at him and he says, she says, don't you, and they're arguing and she says something, a line like that's mad at him and he listens to the line, he's like, that would make a great song. And she says, <laughs> Dewey, don't you write a song about this? <laughs> you that's really doing that all the time though. That's how your mind works. You're always reading things in that kind of way. No, I, but it's, I don't so much anymore because I draw. It's more, the drawing is first. Drawing is the first thing. I don't, I think Ed, Ed probably does. Uh, or did, I should say. Oh, he's probably out there still. He's I'm probably. I'm interested in the ones particularly. I like them all. I like your work a lot and always have. It's, but I like the ones that are funny without the caption. And the yeah. caption tightens it in so that it gives it a point that, yeah. that I don't know how it sharpens it. Yeah. But that, yeah. like the, 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 the Amish midlife crisis is funny as a drawing. Yeah, but that's true. Funny, but then that gives it a, a, a snap that. That's that funny though because the, 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 the caption gives. Yeah, no one's actually pointed that out before, but you're right that mm -hmm. in that you almost don't need Amish mid midlife crisis up there in the box. It's a it's a little superfluous. But it's, it adds a nice yeah. right. Snap. Maybe I'm just saying I never thought of that before, but you make a make an interesting point there because it's funny without it. I mean, I think people would might I don't know. I'm not sure. But I, well, I, yeah. I try. On the single frames. Yeah. And that they're, they're always turned in a, in a really precise, mm. perfect way. Thank you. Thank you. That means a lot to me. I, uh, I work, I work for, I think a lot about those, the way it's, 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 and I think there was a poet that I met once, uh, Yusef, and I won't know how to pronounce his last name. Does anyone know this? A Pulitzer Prize winning Yusef Karma. No? No one knows this? Come on. He said to me that there's poetry in, in the cartoons, in cartoons. And, you know, I, I kind of like to believe him a little bit, um, even though I know very little or nothing about poetry. But my, my mother-in-law, um, who's 92, who just had a stroke well, a year ago, and she's a published poet, when she reads to me her poems, um, I think the same thing. I think this is very much like writing captions. You know, it's very specific. Yeah. I have a book of uh, rejected New Yorker cartoons because uh, the editor thought they were in bad taste. Or yes. Push the envelope too much. Yeah, you're featured in those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're, you're a prolific cartoonist, I think. Um, my question is. How many cartoons a month or whatever period do you submit to the New Yorker out of how many mm -hmm. that you total and how many uh, are rejected or accepted? Yeah, yeah that's a good question. Um, I'm syndicated through Tribune Media, so I, and I've been syndicated since 2008, I think. Um, so I have to generate a daily cartoon six days a week, okay? I'm contracted with The New Yorker. I've been contracted for most of them since 99, which means they have first right of refusal on all my cartoons. So what I do is I generate six or seven cartoons every week. I send them to The New Yorker first. They say, oh, I want, let, I'm gonna take these two to the meeting. So they hold them. Then I have to come up with two more send the rest to my syndicate, and that, and that way the New Yorkers, they'll take those to the cartoon meeting once a week. They'll either buy one, they usually buy one. It's usually I sell once a week, once every two weeks. And I don't care anymore, <laughs> I really don't. I, I used to be, Ed Corn, we used to, we used to go, he used to really hate not selling. It would really drive him crazy. He'd get mad and he was frustrated and I'd be like, Ed, man, you're a legend. <laughs> It doesn't matter anymore. You've done like 60 covers. Um, but he still, he, it really mattered to him. It bothered him. Um, so. That's pretty brutal. That. It's brutal. Yeah. It's absolutely brutal. I mean, I'm lucky because um, whatever is too profane or uh, unpublishable of the seven or eight I generate every week, Seven days will publish. Yeah, well, they're they're the ones that I like. They're usually ones that they publish ones that are that are uh, 
profane and they'll, they'll publish them. So I'm really, and that wasn't, that was kind of by design. I mean, it was, I don't, but it's a really brutal career. It's just, for, for people who have to rely on the New Yorker, it's super hard. Does Seven Days get it through the syndicate? No, I send it directly to Seven Days. Although they get the, the similar drawings than the syndicate. Sometimes the same drawings, and sometimes profane drawings. <laughs> in full transparency, we are friends. Yes, we are. But I'm interested in your art, not the cartoon. Yeah. Do you have a collection of art somewhere? Not mine, right? Uh, yeah, I do. No, you're oh, mine? It's all over the place, you know. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I do. I do. I don't, but I'm not, uh, I'm sick of it, man. I'm kind of sick of looking at my work. I don't hang it up in my house. Mm -hmm. I look at it every now and again and say that's, like, I'll look at my old work and be like, wow, I was really good. <laughs> <laughs> I could really paint watercolors. But um, I'm way more interested in other people's work. But I do have most of my work. Some of it I sell. Some of the New Yorker covers I sell. I sold the King Kong cover to, to uh, the, the company that owns the Empire State Building. Oh, wow. They bought that cover. Yeah, I really love the Amish kid with the watch. Yeah, thanks. That's a yeah, I'm really proud of that. that. That almost got me a gold medal in 1993 from the Society of Illustrators. A guy, a judge, came up to me and said, you were that close. I was like, fuck you. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was, that was, um, um, that piece I am very proud of. Yeah. I like the, the modeling on that really worked out. And uh, my journal drawings, like I said, I'm, but after studying Leonardo da Vinci and seeing his drawings, all those drawings at the Windsor Castle, they're just unbelievable. They're, they blow my mind. I can't believe he was that prolific. And he, he died at 66. Uh, uh, yeah. I'm going to steal some of those. I'm going to break <laughs> in. I'm going to get them. You can't get them. Do you ever consider or have an urge that you will push yourself into fine arts, which you would get paid for a, a, the same amount of work for a whole lot more? I make pretty good money doing cartoons. <laughs> it's so worldly. No, it's not. It's not. It's just the opposite. It's very easy. It, drawing, drawing cartoons is, I love to do it. It's you easy. Come up with dry spells where you're putting Never. Where it's not common? Never. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I used, there was a time yeah. when I used to think of, when I used to think of a cartoon. If you find yourself trying to think of a cartoon, you're just going to hit a wall. Yeah. But the, I just start drawing. Mm -hmm. That's what William Stig said. And Ed would say, Ed Corn would say, just start drawing and see where, see where it takes you. Yeah. And that's, that's a beautiful way to, to work. I paint and I wake up in the morning and there's an idea. And if I don't, I, if I don't mess around and get right to work, yeah. I've got it. And, yeah. And it almost always is really good because I've had it all night to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, that's nice too when you can sleep on it and <laughs> dream of. I've dreamed of paintings. Dreaming's funny. Yeah. That's a whole nother. With your daily cartoons, how do you decide what cartoon comes out on what day? I mean, the, I don't. The publisher does that. I mean, there's some, the, my syndicate does that. I mean, there's some days, like, of course, if Christmas is coming up or a holiday, I'll do some snow cartoons or, you know, some seasonal stuff. Um, beach stuff in the summer. Uh, yeah. Anyone else? Yes. So, why do you say the cartoons you send to uh, Seven Days are profane? Some of them are. I, well, I, I almost say they're sweet. I Some are sweet. Those are, the, those are the, yes, you're right. I should take that back. You're right. Yeah, you're right. No, you're right. I think that's true. They used to be profane. They did. Years ago, they, they would, the, um, uh, I, if I could think of one. You know, there was some, they would publish the sex things, the sex jokes um, that I did which would have, like, there was a woman in bed and the guy's got the bra on and the woman says, I'm going to need that bra back, you know. So it was just those things I couldn't get published in, in, in syndication. Maybe the New Yorker would publish some things, but Seven Days, God bless them, they would, the cartoons that I really liked that were, were unpublishable anywhere else, they would run. But you're right, I think that is true. They are kind of sweet. Yeah, well, I'll get you some.
<laughs> Do people ever ask you to draw their dogs? Yeah, sometimes I'll do that for people. I'll put their dog in a cartoon. Um, just to see if their dog is, you know, not doing well. I do that for people. Um, sometimes. The uh, article about you in seven days, a uh, while mm -hmm. back, it sounded like you sometimes think about giving cartooning up. And uh, I was hoping that's mm. not true. Yeah. Because like six days a week, I look forward to a mm. moment of it's just peaceful. Little, little bliss. I, a little I, moment of bliss. <laughs> it, 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 I, I just uh, love it. I look forward oh, to that's, it every day. Wow. Thanks. That means a lot to me. Uh, I don't think I will just because it's not. But I meant retiring in terms of books and working hard. I, I don't really have any. Uh, I, I don't like promoting. I don't like doing stuff like that. I, I don't. I like coming to libraries and talking to people. but. I think in the world that we live in right now, with social media and this, uh, especially for young people especially, my son's 30, my stepdaughter's 24, there's an immense pressure on young people to be famous, to be seen, to be known, to have followers. And uh, I rail against that, even though I have a lot of followers on Instagram. <laughs> Now that's funny to me, that's just me being an asshole. <laughs> but um, I do rail against it. I think it's terrible for, for young people. It's terrible for creativity. Um, when I think back on my early career, the most important thing for me, and it still is, is the fact that someone is paying me to draw, any, to draw a cartoon that I love to uh, draw, a picture I like to draw. It could be $50 or $100 or, uh, I don't care. But the fact, the joy I get from that is, Amazing. It's just like, I, this is great. I don't need much more than that. So um, I'm going to need a job, so I'll, I'll keep drawing cartoons. And I love to draw my dogs. And I like to make people feel good, so. so does someone, someone here said that you, there's a way to get a cartoon a day from you. Yeah, you can. I See, I suck at promotion. You could go to uh, my website and just type in in your email. It doesn't go anywhere else. It just goes to my, I have a web guy nice. who's Peter Woodward from right. my, our, my art school roommate. God, I love this guy. But he, my website, harrybliss.com, you go in, you put your name in, and you get my cartoon every day in your, in your mail. Can you go back and see older ones? You can see, a t on my website, there's a ton of cartoons on there. The whole log is there. And I sell, pr there's prints there and stuff, and ugh. Tired of me. Yeah. I just thought of something I asked Ed the last time I saw you and Ed together. Yeah. And I asked Ed, does he take uh, suggestions or? Yeah, he doesn't. And he never did, but you do. I do. Yes, I take. Uh, you know, anybody has an idea for a cartoon, you know. Yeah, no, I don't. I, 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 I like collaborating. One of my favorite things to do was, in fact, my brother-in-law, Tony. He's a law professor in Wayne State. Just sent a cartoon to me three weeks ago that the New Yorker bought. And it's great. It's got, uh, I can't, it's on my phone somewhere, but it's got a huge rock, like a boulder, big giant cliff. And it's thinking to itself that it'll never beat rock, sciz never beat scissors or something. It just, I don't know. The, but it was such a funny gag. And I drew it very, like, you know, highly rendered rock. And, uh, and one of my favorite things to do is to call him and tell him the New Yorker bought your cartoon. Uh, it makes me so happy. So, yeah. It, all right. Anybody else? Good. I'm interested that, that I hate commissions because I, I can't. Me too. Every time I'm trying to work, I'm thinking, yeah. will they like this? Will they right. like this? And that's like the kiss of death for getting anything. Uh huh. Good. Yeah. But, you have to work under, you work under that happily every single day. Will they like this? But it's, no, it's not a commission, though, because I'm drawing for me. Okay, so that's... They're just, okay. they're just along for the ride. Okay. <laughs> Quentin Tarantino said that about making movies, which I loved. He said, I make movies for me. It's just, I, this is a luxury that people like my movies. Yeah. That's, that's the way it's turned, you know, it is. So, oh, I hate commissions. Yeah. Can't stand it. Yeah. Draw this. We need a businessman in a suit, uh... I don't know. Even for New Yorker covers? Even for the New Yorker covers. If they, I, 
I still submit on occasion, but yeah, I wouldn't like that. I wouldn't, I might turn, I probably would turn it down. I, I, you reach a certain age in your life, you're like, I don't want to do anything that is going to cause me stress or just like lose sleep or I'd rather, if you can afford it, if you need the money to pay your bills, that's different, but um, yeah, no thanks, man. I'd rather hike, hike in the woods with my dog than sit strapped over a desk. Just so you know, as you've been talking, more and more I've been seeing one of your cute puppies at the podium instead of you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank and you. There, and the dog, of course, is talking about what it's like to live in the cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> he worships me. No kid yourself. Junior. I should have brought him. I actually thought of bringing him. Well, thank you. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. <laughs>